Republicans laundering Russian disinformation again. The lies and vapor underneath the Hunter Biden put up job. I'm Matt Robeson. This is Beyond Politics. We're broadcast on WKXL Radio. We're available wherever you get your podcasts if you're into audio podcasts. And if you like to catch all of this kind of stuff on video, we're up on YouTube on the Blue Amp channel. Lindsay Beierstein covers legal affairs, healthcare, and politics for an outstanding publication called The Editorial Board, also on Alternet, Raw Story, all over the place. She's an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Lindsay, you've done... One of the best analyses I've seen of the crazy backstory that is the Hunter Biden story. So let's just give people a preview of what we're going to get into. You titled your piece, House Republicans Poised to Launder Russian Disinformation Again. It seems like you're seeing a combination of Russian disinformation, right-wing cover for Trump, and total vapor from Elon Musk. Is that right? That about sums it up. The reason that Twitter pumped the brakes on the story back in October of 2020 was because it contained all the hallmarks of a Russian intelligence hack and leak operation, like the one they pulled on the DNC. And they were really concerned about a rerun of that because they'd had ample warnings to look out not only for a hack and leak operation, but for one starring Hunter Biden and one linked to a president linked to a presidential campaign. So Twitter all by itself chose to pump the brakes on this story because they had every reason to think that it was a Russian dirty trick with the collusion of the Trump campaign. We don't know that. We may never know the full story, but there was nothing negligent about what Twitter did. They were applying their own terms of service, their own trust and safety guidelines based on the best information that was available to them at the time. And when you stand back and look at the whole thing, it still does bear all the marks of a Russian disinformation operation. I'll bet you we're going to hear a lot about this story courtesy of Republican-led hearings in the House of Representatives once they take control next year. As much as Democrats are reluctant to get into it because they just feel giving it more attention is sort of letting the Republicans win. I agree with that. But since they're going to drag us there, understanding why, why it's so likely to be Russian disinformation, why there's so much vapor going on here, why this is all just insinuation and innuendo, I think is really important. Could you first refresh us? What happened with this laptop? Okay, so long ago and far away in a magical land known as Delaware, <laughs> there's there used to be a Mac repair shop owned by a guy called John Paul McIsaac, who is, these are both very important things. He's A, legally blind, and B, a frothing conspiracy theorist. And somehow John Paul McIsaac got hold of, he says it's because Hunter Biden dropped off, a, or somebody that he thinks could have been Hunter Biden dropped off this laptop, set of laptops actually for data recovery, and that he started recovering the data from this laptop back in 2019, and he allegedly found stuff that he thought might be evidence of a crime, so he gave it to Rudy Giuliani's lawyer, as you do, and eventually <laughs> the FBI came and subpoenaed the laptop and he handed it over to them, and then he says he was mad because the FBI I didn't use all the glorious treasures from this laptop in the impeachment proceedings, so he decided to go public with it through through Rudy Giuliani. It's kind of a complicated timeline that doesn't really make any sense. The procedural stuff doesn't really line up with what he says he gave to whom and why, which is another reason to be really skeptical about this. But that's the basic idea, was that this... It all came to public attention in October of 2020, so just about three weeks out from the general, maybe a little less, and... So it was the October surprise that the Republicans had been teasing, like Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon had been out there on their podcast saying, we've got an October surprise, we're going to drop it any day now, it's going to blow everything out of the water. So there was every reason to be concerned about what the contents of the story was going to be. And so the New York Post came forward with it after the Wall Street Journal and Fox News and every other report, refu every other reputable news organization, even on the right, refused to touch this thing because it stank so badly. And Rudy Giuliani was pointedly not letting anybody else see this, not letting anybody else see this disc image of the laptop. The actual laptop itself was in the custody of the FBI this by this point. So they had like one guy who was the president's dirty tr main dirty tricks man in the U in Ukraine who was prefer who was proffering this his disk image of a laptop that wasn't allowed to be authenticated by anybody else and rubbing his hands gleefully and bragging about how the New York Post will print anything. 
And given the historical context that we'd lived through, given the Mueller report and the DNC hack and the impe Trump's first impeachment, which was also about trying to strong arm Ukraine into launching a fake investigation into Hunter Biden. Given that whole historical context and additional layers of context about all the other ways Russians have used hack and leak operations in the past from the World Anti-Doping Agency, chemical weapons researchers, George Soros, you name it, they've done it so many times. It's their stock and trade. It's incredibly effective for them to hack these things and leak them with a cover story. And the laptop looked for all the world like the cover story for some other kind of hack, maybe an iCloud attack, for example. Just to be complete, you provide all your receipts in your article. And again, people can look that up. It's on the editorial board. There was a whole deep dive provided by Andrew Rice and Olivia Nuzzi in New York Magazine called The Sordid Saga of Hunter Biden's Laptop. Just to review what you just said, you've got a right-wing conspiracy theorist who is legally blind, who says that he thinks that Hunter Biden came in and dropped off a laptop. And he can't verify that for sure. And he, as you say, his instinct here is, I've got to get this stuff to Rudy Giuliani. And what's really critical in all of this is when we talk about the Hunter Biden laptop, it's actually not a laptop. In the story, what you just said, this guy, John Paul Ringo and George, I think is his name. Turns I just think it was the Tamashanter man. Right. He sounds like the drummer for Led Zeppelin. So he turns, he calls the FBI and he says, look, there's this thing and I, like there, it's weird and it's, it involves Hunter Biden. And so they show up, they take the actual laptop. So at this point, what we're talking about is a copy of a copy of maybe a laptop that might have belonged to a shape that looks like Hunter Biden and on which there was information, much of which was stored in the cloud that could have easily been hacked into Hunter Biden was, he had a substance abuse problem. He was on drugs. How much password security did the man have? So if this was already a vulnerable data source. And so there are all these layers of, we don't know what came from where. Does that about sum it up? It's like, you've got something and some of it seems to be tied to Hunter Biden, but we don't know how much of it is real. Exactly. And the thing to remember about how hack and leaks work is that they work by, in general, being real, in general, having been produced by the victim. And they dump them out there to start to get their partisans generating narratives about these things that are generally real. So what happened was the real public opinion kind of turned on the story once media outlets were able to authenticate some aspects of this huge cache of data. And people didn't have the digital literacy to say, wait, that people jumped to with the urging of Republicans, the idea, well, this vindicates it. Twitter was wrong. It can't have been, it can't have been a dirty trick. It must be real. But the truth is what you would expect from a hack and leak is a large body of real data that has been stolen because, you know, they steal it because it's real and it's compelling because it's real. That said, you don't know that everything in that cache is real. The independent analyses that they've done so far have said it's a forensic nightmare. We can only authenticate so much of this stuff. Well, there's a huge trove of stuff that isn't authenticatable through our cryptographic signatures and all that stuff. There was 217 gigabytes of data. And according to the Washington Post, they were only able to verify a very small fraction of them. There were nearly 129 thousand emails and most of them could not be verified in any way by either of the two security experts who reviewed that data because there was missing data or it was just not at this point it was like so many loose ends had been introduced so what you're talking about here is you put out a small amount of real stuff and that sort of paves the credibility pathway for who knows what Exactly. It creates this kind of glide path. And because there's been some authentication, then the Republicans are urging people to jump to the conclusion, well, it's all real. And more importantly, that the cover story, the story it could be cover, it could be real, but the story is real 
Nashville and not a cover story, that the provenance, it really did come from this weirdo in Delaware and not a GRU hack and leak team. Right. And you point out that the weirdo in Delaware, John, Paul, George, Mac, Isaac, whatever, he can't keep his story straight. He's actually changed his story. So it's like worse than the fact that he's a right-wing conspiracy theorist and he's like proud of that and that he's blind, not dissing on people who are visually impaired, just pointing out a relevant fact here. So in addition to that, he's changed his story. He has, and he had this bizarre meltdown with the Daily Beast. That was my favorite interview with him in October of 2020, where he just kind of freaks out and says, they're all coming to get me. And like, this guy is not a reliable narrator in any way, shape or form.